are you doing doing okay how are you i'm doing fine thank you so much and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the greener life club member interview dr kevin it's my pleasure to be here i've seen uh, many of your interviews and i've uh, heard you speak and uh, it's such a great pleasure to speak with you one and one introduce yourself to the world who dr kevin is all about i'm a professor of chemistry at hampton sydney college in central virginia i um i started doing work in the in the handcrafted soap community in 2005 <clears throat> when i was invited to speak at the annual meeting of the handcrafted soap and cosmetic guild each year i thought that would be the last year cuz they would be out of questions but they keep coming up with more and more questions so it's kind of become a second career for me uh people bring me interesting questions or problems i usually don't know the answer off the bat so i go and try to figure them out and then make a presentation on the results um I've been associated with uh with Essential Depot. I met Derek at the uh Miami Soap Guild meeting and a couple of years later he invited me to speak down in Sebring and we've been in uh in close coordination since then. He's been a great friend to uh my research efforts at Hampton Sydney and um I've been very grateful for the the um relationship that I have with him and with Essential Depot. That was awesome and uh, it was uh, great to hear that and uh, Dr. Kevin chemistry is a most challenging subject you are an expert in it. So are you passionate about chemistry or like uh, how did you end up in choosing such a challenging stream? Uh I've been interested in science and since, since I was a kid I was a boy scientist and uh I had a little a little laboratory in the backyard when I went to college I didn't know I was going to be interested in chemistry I uh I had done archaeological digs during high school and I thought that was going to be my major but it turned out to be chemistry there's just so many things of interest in chemistry it's really at the at the center of all the sciences uh many sciences have a chemical application and um when i became aware of the handcrafted soap community uh i really didn't know very much about soap in particular i had written a chapter in my book caveman chemistry about you know making primitive soap but it turns out that soap is far more complex and interesting than i imagined back in 2000 when i wrote that book um and it just seems like there's never ending questions and interesting questions and uh, dr kevin is there any uh, reason behind naming your book as caveman chemistry well um there had been a previous book called from caveman to chemist it was a a history of chemistry okay but when i invented the course back in about 1995 i imagined that we would walk naked into the woods on the first day of class we would take sticks and rocks and bones and we would make something out of those then we would make something out of that and something out of that and something out of that so um the first project in caveman chemistry is making fire without fire i don't think we would ever have have become human beings fire allows us to change the world in ways that were unimaginable before that so from fire uh the second project is stone tools the fourth project is alcoholic beverages uh the fifth project is pottery so it marches through the book marches through 24 projects in the history of chemistry from uh the invention of fire at the beginning to uh high explosives and polyester at the end of the book mm -hmm. super uh such an interesting and uh, suitable name that you have uh, kept for the book and um, dr kevin uh, what do you think about um uh, the art and the science behind soap making 
Well, um, there are really two, there's a huge division in the soap making world. There's commodity soap making, which is Procter and Gamble, Colgate, Palm of the big companies. They make they make a very uniform product. They make millions and millions of bars of bar of soap that are exactly the same. And there's a place for that in the world. People want to have a, a uniform product that they can count on. But there's also the handcrafted soap making industry. And the handcrafted world is devoted to making almost works of art. Um, so instead of just a plain white bar or a plain blue bar or a plain green bar, you can get all kinds of artistic uh, crafting techniques into the world of handcrafted soap making. The, the palette of oils used is also much larger. In the, uh, in the commodity soap world, there's really only four oils. Um, there's coconut, palm kernel, palm, and tallow. Basically, all commercial soap is made from those four oils. In the handcrafted world, there are dozens of different oils, maybe more than dozens, maybe approaching 20 different oils that, um, that people use for making soap. And each of those oils imparts something slightly different to the final product. You get a different uh, lather texture, you get a different lather quality, you get a different lather longevity. You get, um, if you gave me five bars of soap, I could often pinpoint what oils they contain, in, at least in broad strokes, by the kind of lather that they produce. Olive oil soap, for example, produces a very thin lather, thin lather whereas coconut oil produces copious suds. All of that has chemical applications. So the question of how much of oil, each oil to use, how much sodium hydroxide to use to make soap. If you're making liquid soap, you're substituting potassium hydroxide for sodium hydroxide. There are problems that are faced in the handcrafted industry that aren't faced in the uh, commodity industry. Dreaded orange spots is probably the primary example. Um, um, in the handcrafted industry, uh, a soap may produce may uh, have um, brown spots appear on it after it's produced. That's never seen in the commodity world because they don't use the same oils. They use all saturated fats in the commodity industry. So the use of unsaturated oils in the handcrafted industry presents unique challenges to the soap making process. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin. Um... This might be a layman question, but still I'd like to uh, have the words uh, from your side. What, what are the different types of soaps? For example, uh, they call it as toilet soap. They call it as beauty soap. They call it as uh, cosmetic soaps. What are all the basic types of soap and what, what is the basic difference between naming these soaps? Well, toilet soap is a is the kind of soap that you would use to wash the body. The toilet is the the bathroom, and so toilet soap is is broadly any kind of a bar soap that you use for washing the body. Of course, there are lots of soaps that aren't used to wash the body. There are uh, laundry soaps. There's dishwashing soap. Um, um, what were some of the others that you talked about? Oh, beauty soap. So. One of the issues that we face in the handcrafted industry is that um, soap is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, and the, the, the regulation is very old. It traces back to the 1930s. There's an exemption for soap in, um, in cosmetic regulations where if a product is made primarily of the sodium salts of fatty acids and it's used only for cleaning, then it's regulated as soap and the regulations are far lower than they would be for cosmetics. As soon as you make a claim like uh, this soap is, is good for your complexion or this soap, uh, this soap will make you more beautiful, you've, you've ventured into the realm of cosmetics. And the, the product may be exactly the same as a toilet soap. But something marketed as a beauty soap is going to be regulated as a cosmetic. And there may be state regulations that a producer has to go through to be certified as a, as a cosmetics producer. Um, there are also packaging implications. If you're just marketing soap for cleaning, you don't have to list the ingredients in the United States. 
but if you're marketing it as um, as a beauty product, then you have to list the ingredients according to the prevailing cosmetics regulations. There are also claims that you might make, for example, uh, if you make a soap that's good for treating poison ivy, you're now not a soap and you're not a cosmetic, you're a pharmaceutical now. And if you make such a claim, the, the regulations for a pharmaceutical company are far higher than they are for a soap or a cosmetics company. So you have to be careful of the claims that you make. There are also liquid soaps. Liquid soaps are made with potassium hydroxide instead of sodium hydroxide. It's just a different kind of soap. A liquid soap might be used as a toilet soap for washing the body, or it might be used for a dishwashing or a, or a laundry detergent. Um, one, more, um, one more point is that uh, to be a soap, it has to be an alkali salt of a fatty acid. That's a very particular chemical definition. It's one that's broadly met by any soap maker that makes soap out of just vegetable oil or animal fat and sodium or potassium hydroxide is producing soap. But if you're using any of the modern uh, um, detergents or emulsifiers, you're now strictly in the realm of a cosmetic or a pharmaceutical. So many, uh, many of the melt and pour soaps contain uh, synthetic detergents. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it puts them into a different category. Those soaps are by definition, they're a cosmetic product, not simply a soap product. Awesome. <laughs> Such a clear explanation, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin. And uh, Dr. Kevin, so um, is there any... Uh, difference between the chemical ingredients used in a toilet soap or in a beauty soap or uh, just the name differs if you're using it on the body that's a toilet soap if you're using it for the purpose of beautification that's a beauty soap they might contain exactly the same ingredients or you might add particular ingredients to a beauty soap to um you might use a particular oil for example shea butter or um emu oil or something that you think is going to uh, add a beautifying effect. You might use different ingredients depending on the intended purpose, but you could in fact make one soap and label it two different ways for two different purposes. What is the pH level testing? Okay, so pH is, a, is um, often misunderstood in, uh, in the soap world. The pH is technically the hydrogen ion activity. It's the natural log, negative natural log, the, the ne negative common log of the hydrogen ion activity. That's a very technical description. But the point is, if you're going to measure pH, it's you're measuring pH in a dilute solution. So if you're trying to measure the pH of a soap product, it's no good to stick a pH meter up against a solid bar of soap or into a paste, you wanna dilute that product to uh, probably about 1%, 1% soap solution. And you can use a pH meter or pH test strip or pH indicator to look at the, um, at the pH of that dilute soap. You would never wanna measure pH in a concentrated solution. The, it starts to lose its meaning once the solution is concentrated. I prefer talking about alkalin alkalinity rather than pH. Alkalinity is beyond the, uh, beyond the natural pH of soap. Is there any excess alkali present? And there's a way to measure that. You can measure it using a pH indicator like phenolphthalein, but it tells you soap is naturally an alkaline product. It's naturally basic. Its pH is naturally higher than seven. But if a soap is overly alkaline, it can be harsh. So rather than using a pH meter to measure that, I prefer to do a titration. A titration might take maybe five minutes. It's not a very long procedure, but you can put a number to how alkaline soap is. And I prefer talking about alkalinity as a measure of harshness rather than simply pH. Different soaps made from different oils will have a different pH and dilute solution. And it doesn't make that one bad or better than the other if its pH is higher or lower. 
but excess alkali uh, in any soap is going to make it harsh. Okay, uh, doctor. And uh, Dr. Kevin, what do you think about adding essential oils to soap, especially in handcrafted soaps? And uh, how can we measure the purity of essential oils? So essential oils are distilled or pressed out of vegetable sources, principally flowers or leaves. Um, they're very popular in the handcrafted soap world. There's a large overlap between handcrafted soap and aromatherapy. Um, each of those oils is a complex mixture. It's none of them, very, very few of them are pure compounds. So when we test the, the, uh, whether an essential oil is genuine, we uh, test it using something called gas chromatography. Mm -hmm. We inject the oil into a machine which separates it into the many, many components that it contains. And then we compare the percentages of each of those compounds to the published literature that tells us, for example, what does lavender oil contain? Lavender oil is a good example. It's primarily linalool and linoleal acetate. There are two major compounds in lavender oil. They differ from place to place and from season to season in the percentage of each of those two, but there are also a dozen or more smaller contributors to lavender oil. And many times when we're looking for whether the lavender oil is genuine or not, we're looking at the small minor components to find out whether they're present and whether they're present in the right concentrations. Some essential oils are almost pure, purely one compound. So um, um, wintergreen, oil of wintergreen is almost uh, almost 100% uh, methyl salicylate is the name of the compound. So it's very challenging to find, to distinguish a, a genuine oil of wintergreen from a synthetic because we're looking at the at very, very tiny concentrations of, of small minor components to distinguish pure methyl salicylate from a genuine wintergreen essential oil. Okay. Um, so Dr. Kevin, are the essential oils from Essential Depot are tested for gas chromatography? Yes, each batch of, uh, of uh, essential oil that's received by um, Essential Depot comes to me as a sample. I run a gas chromatograph mass spectrum on it. Uh, I compare it to several different uh, standards. And then I make a determination as to whether that oil is a genuine oil or whether it's been mixed with, sometimes you find when essential oils are produced, sometimes they're mixed. So you get lavender oil from one place mixed with lavender oil from another place. And I make a final determination as to whether I think that that oil is a genuine essential oil or whether it's been adulterated in some way. So Dr. Kevin, you are adding value to Essential Depot's customers. Super. Because uh, they will have the trust and the uh, confidence that they are using pure essential oil. And I would also say for each of those batches, we uh, Essential Depot publishes the uh, gas chromatograph so that a uh, individual customer can look at that report and compare it to the standards and decide for him or herself whether that meets the specifications that they would like to achieve. There are different some people might have a, a, a higher or a lower expectation on the exact properties of an essential oil. And that gas chromatograph gives them the power to look for themselves and decide whether that particular oil is going to meet their needs. Super. This means a lot to the customers, Dr. Kevin, because many people um, create handcrafted soaps just for a thousand of personal reasons, like uh, the skin problems of their family members or the skin problems of their children. So when they have the uh, trust that essential oils from the essential depot are pure, they can confidently go ahead and creating uh, soaps for a purpose. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kevin, for being uh, such a great value addition to essential depot.
and uh, and the next question is like are fragrance oils and essential oils the same no they're different so fra fragrance oils are any oils that are added to uh, impart an aroma or a smell or a fragrance to a product essential oils Essential oils are a subset of that. They might be used for a fragrance. They might be used for a purpose other than fragrance, but uh, essential oils by definition come from plant materials. So they're distilled or they're pressed. Uh, most essential oils are distilled. They're usually steam distilled from, uh, from a plant material. Uh, citrus oils are pressed out of the peel of a citrus fruit, but they all, share the the common origin of having been from a plant material. So I'll use lavender as an example. To be in a to be a lavender oil, there has to be a lavender plant that was harvested and then placed into a still and steam went up through the lavender plant. And the smell that you smell at the end from the lavender oil are the same compounds that were present in the plant that you distilled it from. You could take uh, linalool from a completely different source. You could manufacture linalool from, from petroleum, for example. You could manufacture linalool acetate, and you could have a mixture of linalool and linalool acetate to a, to a lay person. It would smell very much like lavender. Mm. Very interesting. So the same element, the same component in lavender oil can be extracted from petroleum as well? So they're, at, at the heart, all essential oils are organic compounds and petroleum is an organic product. Um, chemists can make lots of things from petroleum. You could, you could even make it from animal fats. You could make it from a wide variety of sources. At the heart, it's just... Um, it's just uh, carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. Those can come from a variety of places. To be an essential oil, it had to come from a particular plant. If you say it's lavender oil, it had to come from a lavender plant. If it didn't come from a lavender plant, it's not lavender oil. It might be a fragrance oil and it might smell very, very similar to lavender, but you wouldn't call it a, a, an essential oil. Mm. Superb. Uh... You sound like a chemistry library. <laughs> <laughs> so much of information behind. And um, Dr. Dan, um, you already uh, said that, like how you met uh, Derek and uh, how you are associated with the Essential Depot. What do you think about the essential oils and all the product ranges that Essential Depot is handling? Well, they produce a, uh, a wide variety of products at a, at a really good price. Um, um, they supply the vegetable oils and the lye and the, the sodium and potassium hydroxides, glycerin, uh, a lot of different essential oils. They're really a one-stop shop for a soap maker. There might be, um, there might be some some specialty products that they that you might go to another company for but if you were looking for one company to supply all of your soap making and cosmetic making needs essential depot is a great place so what kind of significance does essential depot gives to the quality of its products uh, dr kevin so uh, a lot of a lot of businesses will buy a, a, a product from a supplier and then they package it up and, and send it out as a retail product. But they're really, they're really trusting their supplier. And Essential Depot was in that situation before um, we started our association. They were buying essential oils from a lot of different companies, but they were trusting those companies to send them you know, genuine, uh, genuine essential oils. What's happened since uh, I came on board is that we trust but verify. So if somebody is sending us lavender oil, they're testifying that they're sending us lavender oil, but we're gonna test it and make sure that it really is. What we found is that since I started testing, suppliers send us better oils than they used to because they know that we're going to test them. 
a, a lay person might not be able to smell the difference between um, lavender oil and lavender oil. Those are two very similar oils. Most people would not smell the difference, but the price is quite different because uh, the lavender plant pr produces more oil per kilogram. So the lavender oil is a cheaper oil than a lavender oil. Some suppliers might try to pass lavender oil off as lavender oil, but Essential Depot tests, and you can see the gray area between them. You can see when you look at the GC reports as to what the concentrations are of each component and decide for yourself whether that oil is going to meet your application. Okay. Um, Dr. Kevin, have you had any experience in uh, tracing out an adulterated oil while testing uh, the essential oils? Yeah, we found adulterated oils. Early on, um, we found adulterated oils. The most egregious example was a lavender oil. It smelled like lavender oil, but it was, um, it was about 80% uh, uh, diethyl phthalate, which is a synthetic chemical used in the fragrance industry as a something to dilute fragrance oils. It was no way, shape or form was it an, a lavender oil. It was, a, it was a fragrance oil masquerading as a lavender oil. And um, so I was able to spot that early on. We haven't, since suppliers know that we're going to test every batch of oil that comes in, they um they don't try i don't see those anymore people people know that we're going to be testing so i find very few adulterated oils now compared to when we started ethyl a diethyl phthalate was a common dilutant that we found in the first batches of essential oil that um that i tested but it's been years since i saw that in any of the essential oils that i've tested Okay, so probably um, uh, the case would have been uh, some years behind, like uh, four or five years back? Yeah, at least five years, maybe longer than that. Okay. Um, after hearing you, I guess like every um, company that deals with essential oils needs to have a gas chromatography test for their oils, isn't it, doctor? Well, there are three levels. You would expect that the uh you know there are the companies that 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 produce essential oils on a large scale they'll sell 55 gallon drums of essential oil so you would expect those people to test their own oils i don't know that they all do you would expect a company like essential depot is going to order 55 gallon drums of essential oil and then they're going to break it up into four ounce bottles or 16 ounce bottles you would expect them to also test their essential oils. And I don't think many of them do. Essential Depot stands out as a company that tests the incoming product before it packages them. The, the highest level would be for you're an individual soap maker and you're buying, a, you're buying an oil from a company it's not going to be a cost effective. Uh, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer costs on the order of $100,000. And there are operating costs. You have to supply it with things. So it costs tens of thousands of dollars per year to maintain it in operation. It would be unrealistic for a, a small handcrafted company to, to, to buy a gas chromatograph for that purpose. But what they could do is to send it out for independent testing. If they had any suspicions about the company they were dealing with, then they could send it out. And for a couple of hundred dollars per sample, they could get a report that says what exactly is in this essential oil and whether it meets their standards. I wouldn't discourage somebody from doing that. If you're making a, a hundred bars, it's probably not worth your while. But if you're selling thousands of bars per year, then it might very well be something that you would wanna do just to make sure, just as Essential Depot tests and the suppliers know that we test, if you're buying essential oils from a company and they know you're going to have them tested, 
they're going to be more careful about what they send you. Superb. So this uh, gas chromatography testing is also essential to pose social responsibility concern. Uh, kudos to essential to uh, Dr. Kevin and uh, thank you for being uh, such a noble part in uh, the, the testing uh, stream. And uh, Dr. Kevin, what do you think about uh, Shia butter? And when you hear this word, are you striked with the, with your recent visit to Africa? The, we recently visited Ghana to see um, uh, Alfred's uh, operation for producing shea butter. It was very interesting. Um, the people we met were all um, extremely friendly, and we had we I think we had a genuinely great time. Um, when we entered the village, they sang us uh, their welcoming song. And when we left the village, we also sang them a song. And I think that really tickled them. Um, the, it was really interesting to see it go from a, a, a shea fruit sitting on the ground to the final uniform shea butter product in a, in a Greener Life tub. And it was very labor intensive. We watched them make it from beginning to end. And there's a lot of, of muscle and ingenuity that goes into turning that raw shea fruit into the finished butter. I couldn't be more impressed with that operation. Uh, I know Alfred has uh, designs to streamline it to save them labor. And I think I applaud that wholeheartedly, but um, you know, it was just amazing to see it go all, you know, from uh, from a natural material into a finished product, all in one place, and all produced by the same people. Super. We could witness uh, this uh, happiness with the smile on your face, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin. Uh, how many days were you there in Ghana? We were there for eight days. We were in Wa for uh, for a day and a half, looking at the at the uh, Alfred's operation in Wa. We also went on safari uh, in Mole National Park, and we did some traveling around Tamale. We looked at two other shea butter producing operations, and it was interesting to see the the similarities between those and also the differences. Um, um, one example was it, when we went to Mole, they had a kind of adobe that they had applied to the, uh, to the stonework. They produced decorative patterns and it turned out that that, uh, that adobe product is made out of the waste product of the shea butter production. Mm. So um, Alfred had talked to us about, well, they don't know what to do with the waste uh, materials, particularly waste water from producing shea butter. And so um, we're hoping that uh, he may be able to find that useful to produce another product out of the waste from, from shea butter production. Okay, awesome, awesome. And Dr. Kevin, uh, in what way essential depots Shia butter is better than other uh, Shia butter produced uh, in the market? I'm not sure that I would use the word better in the sense that the, the product is Shea butter. A Shea butter should be a uniform product. When you buy Shea butter, it should, be, um, should have all the properties of Shea butter. It should come from a Shea plant and not be mixed with other, other materials. I think what Essential Depot and the Greener Life Club is adding to that is the fair trade aspect. And that is that we are um, doing our best to ensure that the people that make the shea butter, the women in the collective actually benefit from their hard labor in a way that's commensurate with the, um, the people farther down the food chain, the people that, that uh, are going to ship it uh, within Ghana and ship it out of Ghana into the United States. Everyone will make money off of that as is appropriate, but we're taking special pains to ensure that the original producers of the shea butter also benefit materially from their hard labor. Um, 
there are challenges there for I think maybe the primary challenge is that the women in Wa don't speak English. And so people people communicating from the outside can't speak to them directly. We love Alfred and we think he's a, a great manager, but it was it just like with essential oils, you trust but verify, you want to make sure that things are as they appear. It would be, um, I think it would be beneficial if uh, we could support, for example, English language uh, education for the children of the village so that as they grow up, they could have people within the village that commu could communicate with commercial interests on the outside. Okay, super. And is our Shia butter, is essential divorce Shia butter? certified for quality or uh, what uh, different certification we have for our shia butter or dr kevin so there are um there are uh there's a fatty acid profile for shea butter um i just took the samples in uh in in may and it's summertime now i'm actually in new orleans right now visiting family i haven't had a chance to analyze it but that'll be one of the first things we do in the fall is to analyze the shea butter we're getting out of the wa collective and the shea butters from different suppliers and comparing that to uh, the international standards for what um what shea but what should be the properties of shea butter that'll be something i'll be doing in the fall Okay, super. And uh, you were talking about the fair trade uh, practices that uh, we are instilling in uh, the production of Shia butter. So what do you think about the four different uh, diamonds in the Greener Life diamonds value, uh, Dr. Kevin? So there are four, uh, four elements of the diamond. It's, it's modeled after the NFPA diamond, which is a, 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 a a logo used in the United States for fire protection, the National Fire Protection Association, um, gives at a glance the properties of materials in warehouses for firefighters. The Greener Life Diamond promotes four values. The One of them is the low carbon footprint. So wherever possible, we look for ways to lower the carbon footprint of our products. Uh, one is um, it's animal friendly. <clears throat> so wherever possible, we reduce the use of animals, animal testing in, in cosmetic products. There's um, the earth friendly aspect where we're talking about preserving the environment. Wherever possible, we look for ways that our products will reduce the, um, the burden to the planet that uh, that human commercial interests bring with them. And finally, the fourth element of the diamond is fair trade. Wherever possible, we look for ways to ensure that the principal producers of a product benefit material from their labor, in addition to all the transport and packaging and all of the things that, that go from the original product down to the the commercial product that you buy from Essential Depot. So all of those values are aspirational. We're looking for ways to make the world better, one product at a time, one shopping experience at a time. When we look for a <clears throat> new supplier of a product like Shea Butter, we're looking not to just find a, a cheaper supplier of a product, but to look for a supplier that can promote the four values of the Greener Life Diamond. It's a moving target. So we're constantly reevaluating um, um, how we're able to institute those values. And we invite our customers who also share those values to buy products from the Greener Life Club to promote, promote those four values and to support our efforts to try to promote those values among our customers and our suppliers. Superb, and this is a need of the hour, uh, Dr. Kevin, and uh, it's time to make the world a better place, especially for our uh, generations to uh, follow and breathe. 
And uh, Dr. Kevin, um, as we were talking about biofriendly, uh, what do you think about uh, the packages that Green Alive Diamond uh, um, certified packages or essential depots tub? What what are all the uh, unique features in it? So um, um, one of the one of the needs that Derek found when he first started looking at shea butter production in Ghana was that there was no um, there was no easy supply of containers for packaging shea butter. One of the places that we went to uh, was selling shea butter just in plastic bags. And the plastic bags are one thing that you would throw away at the end. So you buy a plastic bag of shea butter and then you unwrap it and you throw it away. The, um, the Greener Life tub is a really nice product because it provides our shea butter producers in, uh, in Ghana with a, a uniform package that they can use. The package is reusable, it's very sturdy. You could use it for a wide variety of purposes. And in fact, um, Derek is encouraging them not only to produce shea butter in those packages, to produce other things, to use it for other purposes. So it's not something that's gonna wind up in a landfill. It's something that's gonna go through multiple uses from the time it was produced until the time that it's no longer useful. It's a sturdy product that's not disposable. It's a product that can be reused over and over again. Okay, so uh, is that recyclable? Uh, can we recycle the green life? Cups? Yes, the plastic is recyclable, but even if you have recyclable plastic, it's a challenge in the United States that, um, you know, it's one thing for a plastic to be recyclable, it's another to actually have it be recycled. And so um, at our college, we went through years and years where we, uh, we collected recyclables and we packaged them up and we sent them off. We found out only later, it wasn't cost effective to, to recycle them. And they just went in the landfill after all our effort to separate them out into the different kinds of plastic. So yes, the plastic is recyclable. It could be melted down and turned into other products. But more than that is the product is durable enough that it could be used over and over again before it's recycled. And that, that reduces the amount of waste in the world to have, a, to have a container that can be reused over and over again for different purposes. Super. And uh, Dr. Kevin, like, um, mm, what is the difference between the shelf life of a commercial soap and a handmade soap? So a shelf life is a, is a date that somebody puts on a product in order to ensure that it's gonna be a, a good product within some time frame. Soap has a very long shelf life and Commercial soap makers will produce a date on it, but uh, the, the, the date, um, I won't say it's arbitrary. There are probably formulas that they use to calculate how long their, um, their shelf life is going to be. Handcrafted soap is probably gonna have a shorter shelf life than one that you buy in the grocery store, primarily because it contains uh, unsaturated oils Unsaturated oils are subject to oxidation. Many of the oils that we prize in handcrafted soap making like olive oil are unsaturated oils. They're liquid at room temperature. They're subject to um, oxidation by oxygen in the air. So the, the shelf life of a handcrafted soap is probably gonna be shorter than it would be for a soap like a commercial soap that um, uses only saturated fats. I've talked to um, handcrafted soap makers though, why don't they just eliminate the liquid oils and they, uh, the liquid oils bring something to soap that the solid fats don't. And so handcrafted soap makers are not willing to, um, not willing to give up on those liquid oils as a, as a soap making oil. Um, Soap is probably gonna be used before it 
its useful shelf life is over. It's designed as a product that's going to get used up. And it's possible that something could outlive its useful shelf life, but I think it's kind of remote. You would know it if the oil is getting, if the soap is getting slimy or it has an oily feel to it. But um, a friend of mine gave me some, uh, some soap from World War II. And it was manufactured in the 1940s. It's still useful soap. It's brown now. It used to be white. It's brown because it's oxidized over the decades. But if you wash your hands with it, it still works as soap. Awesome. Uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> this major industry needed an expert like Dr. Kevin. That's the reason uh, Fortune has shifted you from a totally different stream to a more uh, significant stream, uh, Dr. Kevin. Like, uh, what is the hot process or cold process in soap making? We hear such terms. Uh, what is the major difference between those two, Doctor? So, cold process is a term that was uh, the the original soap process was a boiling process. You added oil to a a, a lye solution and boiled it. Um, Starting in the 1700s, people discovered that you could add oil to a concentrated lye solution and not boil it, and you could turn it into soap. But it was uh, very frowned upon by the soap industry because it generally produced a harsh soap. There's no way to, to determine how much sodium hydroxide the oil needed to be used. That calculation came in the early 1800s, and by the mid-1800s, cold process soap was a, a viable soap-making process, but it was still not the dominant process used in the soap industry. Um, primarily, you're mixing oil with sodium hydroxide solution, and you're not boiling it. That's what makes it the cold process. It may be we might say it's a, a warm process because you do melt the oils, uh, but you're talking about temperatures between 100 and 140 Fahrenheit um, rather than a full boiling process. So that's the cold process. Later on in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, people using the cold process started putting the soap intentionally into an oven or a crock pot or a microwave oven. And they called that a hot process because they weren't simply relying on the natural heat released during the soap making process. They were adding an external source of heat. But that hot process is still, now we're talking about 140 to 150 to 160 Fahrenheit. You're still not talking about a full boiled as in the old soap making process. Um, the chief difference between the old, so the old soap making process and the cold and hot process is that you're carefully weighing out exactly the amount of sodium or potassium hydroxide that you need to turn the oil into soap. In the old fashioned boiling process, you used an excess of sodium hydroxide more than you needed and then you neutralize the soap farther down the line. So <clears throat> there, are very, there are various acronyms for different kinds of hot process, <clears throat> but essentially the difference is you're adding an external heat to the soap making reaction rather than just relying on the heat that it produces naturally as a part of the soap making reaction. Okay, interesting. So which one is more beneficial, especially for a new soap maker? And uh, which one would you recommend, Dr. Kevin? I'm not sure that one is harder than the other. Most people start out making a cold process soap, and then they discover there's a hot process, and they, they, um, they use it because they like the texture of it. Or there's one real benefit of a hot process, and that is that... Um, if you heat it, you can get the, the oil and lye to turn into soap and a finished soap that's still in a moldable state. And you can then add things to it while it's still hot and molten. Things like essential oils that might be damaged by a cold process, by the excess alkalinity, alkalinity in a cold process. 
So some people use a hot process because they like the texture of the soap. Some people use it because they want to add something to the soap that would be damaged or, or diminished by the alkalinity of cold process soap. The disadvantage of hot process is that um, um, it doesn't scale as easily. So if you're making 10 pounds of soap in a, in a uh, saucepan, you can scale that up to 50 pounds or 100 pounds or 200 pounds. You just need a bigger container and a, and a better way to mix your oil and your lye. When you add heat to that, you're looking for a reliable way to produce uniform heat. And there are, in the restaurant trade, there are devices, steam jacketed um, containers, for example, that will produce that heat. But you're talking about a larger investment in your, in your um, tools when you're trying to scale up hot process versus cold process. Okay, superb, superb, uh, Dr. Kevin. Like, um, for example, say someone is struggling to market their soap. So what kind of uh, soap making shows or what kind of trade shows uh, should such people visit? So an easy place to get into is, um, is a, a local farmer's market. Uh, in, in my town of Farmville, there's a farmer's market every Saturday. And I went there recently and sure enough, there were several soap makers there selling soap to the, to the, to the end user. And that's probably an easy way to get in because otherwise, if you just, if you just build a website, nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows how to find you. Um, I would start with a farmer's market or a, a, a local craft show. Um, there are craft shows that are not every week, but they might be like a pre-Christmas show or something like that is another good way to get an initial following. Once you get into a larger production, you're probably going to want to go on the internet, have a website that people can find. Um, um, Amazon.com is a place where people sell their handcrafted soap. And so that's another market. Uh, Amazon would give you a place to find new customers because they can search for handcrafted soap and, uh, and your products would come up in that search. Super. So Dr. Kevin, uh, so much of information a bundle of significant information, especially for people associated with the soap making industry. And um, no doubt that Dr. Kevin is certainly a treasure to Essential Depot, as well as the entire world, which is seeking for environment friendly uh, environment. So thank you so much, Dr. Kevin, for being with us. And uh, we wish that you reach greater heights in the future as well. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you.